Hey, this is David McCall, host of the QTS Experience podcast. And this week, I'm joined by Professor Christina Chase, the managing director and co-founder of the MIT Sports Lab, which works with professional teams, global brands, and elite sports organizations. They're tackling key questions at the intersection of data, sport, and engineering. Professor Chase holds two appointments in MIT School of Engineering, where she teaches sports technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship. You don't want to miss this conversation. So join us on the next QTS Experience. The most valuable commodity on earth today is data. How we make it, use it, move it, and protect it. My name's David McCall. Join me today for the QTS Experience. Three, two, one, the QTS Experience with Professor Christina Chase. Professor, thank you for joining us on the show. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. I am uh, I'm pretty stoked to have you here for a variety of reasons. One, I love technology. Two, I love data. And I love to see them coming together with sport and, um, and how they, what the benefits of that are, what the possibilities are, and also the things we got to mitigate against. And I've had the good fortune to listen to you speak many times and read some of the things that you've published. And I thought maybe we would start with what is your, your, you're at MIT. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do there? And um, let's, let's just start there. Fantastic. So uh, as you mentioned, um, at MIT, um, and uh, I run the MIT Sports Lab. And what we do at the Sports Lab is we look to tackle challenges at the intersection of sports, data, and engineering. And so that might look like anything from data science to material science, but it's really around things like um, talent ID and development. Can I understand who might be the next messy? Um, Can I understand what the ideal development pathway might look like for that individual? Hmm. Um, Things like in-game strategy. Can I reverse engineer my opponent's playbook? and optimize for a lineup in game. Um, Also athlete health and performance. Can I better understand increasing risk factors that might lead me to change a training protocol or recovery protocol? Hmm. Also things like uh, next generation fan engagement and OTT, which is kind of the new way we're consuming sports. Mm better understanding how fans are engaging and who might be the next generation of fans, as well as smart venues and stadiums. So um, there's a lot of of infrastructure that's going into these new venues such that it can facilitate different types of in-game experiences. I've grown up following dirt bike racing and I thought what could you other you know what can it what is it that we can add to dirt bike racing that would change the fan engagement for me well just this summer they added drones so as the folks are racing normally you've got your 30 cameras or NASCAR or whatever what while you're watching the race or Formula One while you're watching the race you've got the different camera angles you would have the blimp shot you'd whatever but with the drone flying along just behind, just out of view. But to you, you can see every little line. If it's a car race, you see how they're drifting up and blocking, like all the art of what's happening. It, I can't wait to see it. And I'm sure it is already happening, um, you know, with the cable cameras in where you come down into the huddle of an NFL game or on the field with the great soccer players. And it just, it blows your mind because it changes the perspective. Things that looked really small are now really large or things that were really large have come into really sharp focus and how fast they move. Very much so. And being able to, as you mentioned, see strategy unfold that at a greater distance or angle may be hard for the average fan to, to get to see. And so that, uh, that ability to start to feel really part of the event, part of the game and the competition. I think we're seeing a lot more uh, exciting developments with. Absolutely. One of the things that I, or one of the places where I'd like to start is sort of in this, the idea of data analytics, gathering the data. You've spoken about this 
on, on a number of occasions about um, let's collect data. Famously, the, one of the things that I heard that really brought it home for me, you were talking about high jumpers and how camera data, how camera technology was used in the, the three phases. I didn't even know there were three phases to the high jump. It's like you run and you jump. No, you've got the pre-jump, the jump, and the post-jump. And um, But it, as you talk about that, um, can you talk a little bit about how your lab or labs like yours or, or the world of technology and sports coming together to do the data analytics and then tease that out into, um, we, we can collect a lot of data and not necessarily is all of it useful. Very much so. And I, I like to joke that for most sports data, it's not actually big data, it's awkwardly medium-sized data. <laughs> so, um, it's at the stage whereby we are seeing more than we have ever before, but it is still not big data. And to your point, much of it is in a variety of, of, kind of levels of usability. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what is very exciting about sports and being able to do research in sports is that sports is this beautiful microcosm of society hmm. and broader global challenges. Like the, the smart stadium mm -hmm. is a beautiful testing for future urban design. Mm -hmm. The quantified athlete is gonna help us inform global health and wellness initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, understanding how fans are engaging online helps us also understand human dynamics and social systems. Yeah. And it is this new, these new streams of data that are allowing for new techniques to be applied within the field. And what is so beautiful about sports research is that unlike other industries, it has this clear objective function. Mm -hmm win and it has clear constraints right we have the rules of the game the athletes on the pitch the size of the field and so we can test and experiment and we also have a very much faster feedback loop and so what's really fun about the adoption of technology is that it is allowing for a lot more data to be collected. But to your point, one of the other challenges is that there's a lot of unusable data. Mm -hmm. More data doesn't equal better data. Mm -hmm. It just equals more data. Right. Um, and so being able to understand what is usable and what's not, we do a lot of data validation as a baseline. Mm. Is this even usable? for analysis, mm -hmm. but now how do we tie these different data streams together for a more holistic view <laughs> rather than having them sit in silos? One of the things you refer to, I knew I was gonna like you when you referred to the movie Moneyball, <laughs> as it was a joyous, I, I was probably the only person in the stadium who just, I just saw Brad Pitt and, you know, baseball and sport. I had no idea that it was, and, you know, based on Billy Bean's story, I didn't pay any attention to it. And I didn't know it was based upon a book. And, you know, it, it was this Hollywood interpretation, but it's this amazing idea of using um, analytics to put a, um, put a team together. And as you're, I'm wondering though, as they're putting together, like they did in the movie, the spreadsheet, how do you know what's actionable? Let's just set aside in the interest of time, um, the ability to collect data. I have some mechanism, whether it's cameras, wearable, whatever. I have some mechanism to gather the data. How do I, you know, one of the, my favorite scenes in there was the argument between, by the way, you learn it's not really exactly how it happened, but why let that get in the way of the drama of that scout talking about being a baseball person and arguing with Brad Pitt's character, uh, Billy Bean, real life person, and arguing with him about, you know, there's baseball people, we got our gut instinct, we got these other things. And 
um, you know, how, how are we doing this with this data provided by this Yale graduate and all, all of these are the things that I'm wondering, how do we distill down to the science of it? Here's what we're collecting. Here's what the numeric values tell us. Here's what we should infer from it and the art of it. And then the second part, I guess, of my question is, Baseball teams, at least then, I don't know how they are now, or any choose a sport, how do you staff to have an expert? Or even do you turn to a grad student? Do you turn to the automotive industry? Do you turn to the military? Do you turn to somebody that's spent time looking at data and drawing uh, uh, conclusions for a long period of time? So how do you get to actionable data? And then who do you work with to help? Um, help you build a team that can, um, you know, make it, uh, make data worthwhile? So no, it's an excellent question because um, you've, you've hit on two really important components. One is actionable. Yeah. An actionable insight. And the second is having the talent to help with the analysis, both with the collection but then also with that analysis. And so I will say baseballs, further than I had been any of the other sports with data, they're, they're very savvy in that area because they've had it in the game for a much longer period of time than other sports. And other sports are, are coming online with it, but, but baseball's pretty far ahead in a relative sense. Um, but that said, um, technology is a tool. It's not an answer. And so the best analytics groups first listen to what are the most salient questions the front office, the GM might have before draft or the scouts are seeing or the coach has and answering questions that arm them with another tool in their toolkit. Mm. But rather than going to them and saying, this is your lineup, or we recommend benching, you know, your small forward, it is really listening to what would be useful, finding ways to then communicate it in a way that that individual can take action, but not overwhelming. Mm. not just coming with here, here are the 17 spreadsheets that got me to this answer. Right. right? Um, but then it's also talent. And this is something that um, we talk to pro teams, uh, leagues, federations about quite a bit, finding the talent that is able to both do the analysis, but able to also effectively communicate those insights per the stakeholder, per the the audience it's going to, whether it's a scout, a coach, a GM, a president, an athlete, et cetera. And those are all different communication mechanisms. And it's also knowing when is the right time Mm -hmm. for what insight for that particular stakeholder. Have, have you seen um, as, whether it's baseball, well, first, let me ask this, besides baseball, what other sports, tr- traditional stick and ball or whatever sports have really embraced the idea of levering technology to improve the result of the game? Great question. I would say the NBA has done a really nice job. Um so in 2014-2015 season, they outfitted all of their arenas with optical player tracking systems. And so now we're just getting to that point where really we've got some really healthy data sets mm-hmm. that can provide interesting new types of analysis to be done that couldn't be done before. Um, in American football, you've got... Um, all of the NFL players with RFID chips in the right and left shoulder pads. Some also have it in the back of the the bottom of the neck area. Um, And so there's new data coming online with uh, football. Hmm. 
Same with optical player tracking systems in uh, soccer. So uh, whether it's a Premier League, uh, FIFA is doing a lot to uh, test new technologies for World Cup. Mm -hmm. So uh, cricket's got technology integrated. I mean, you name it. That, I, I guess that, you know, one of the things we, we talk about data a lot on the, my, my industry is the data center industry. So we're constantly talking about creating data, moving data, protecting data, um, destroying data. <clears throat> um, I learned not long ago, I learned it's been posed that in terms of regular non-military, regular public companies, public or private companies, that create the most data on earth that GE is one of them. And I thought, GE, why GE? <clears throat> all their turbines, all of the generators, all the train locomotives, all of these things, each, so many of those mechanisms are being hooked up to essentially IoT devices and they're dumping this stuff. So conversation for another day, but talk about data, not smog, but data fog, it's just craziness. But who, if, if I'm an athlete, in any of these um, sports, and they're tracking this information, do I do I own my own data? Does the um, do both teams? Does the league who who owns my data? And does it? Ch I guess it does. It change like if I'm a if I'm a wearable, if I RFID, or if I'm literally tracking um, biometric information about myself, my pulse, perspiration, whatever, as opposed to my position on a court, I wonder if there's different values there, what, what you own as opposed to what the team may own. Oh, that's a great question. And I think this is a conversation that we're going to continue to see come up. And the answer is, it depends. <laughs> so, so to be a uh, least satisfying type of answer, but um, let me explain. Sure. So if it is in game, the league owns it, which is then passed to the teams for okay. access. If it's in training, maybe it's strength testing or gait analysis, mm -hmm. the team owns it. Mm. Depending on the collective bargaining agreement, an athlete might choose to wear something that allows them to track different parts of movement. Mm -hmm. They would own that. Okay. But again, it's the, it depends. So is it the performance team that is doing the testing? Mm -hmm. Is it an athlete collecting it on themselves or is it in game? And a lot of uh, technology is restricted in game. And so what you'll see are you know, the approved player tracking devices. But now what that challenge is, is how do I understand workload in game and in training and marry different data sets together to understand whether or not this athlete <clears throat> has been under uh, unusual amount of strain, right, and could potentially lead to injury, right. It, it it's such a you know so many times we talk about on my show how in so many ways as human beings evolve, as we learn to adapt to the societal situations around us, the environmental, climactic, or climate changes, technology can race so far ahead of us. For example in the data center industry, we host the cloud. If people wonder where the cloud is or the whatever, your social media, your cat video, your ESPN replay, it's in a data center like ours, um, either on the edge or near the core. But when you walk into my facility today, you would have had to get a temperature check. You would have to ask some health questions at the security facility before you can go anywhere. So the, the other things that we collect are what badge we have biometric information as we allow you physical access with, within the facility and it that's understood that my company owns that and they can make it available to law enforcement or whatever they can use it for whatever they want but in the past any of my health information that i choose to share 
um, that's protected under HIPAA and it's got these other laws and whatever. And so we're now because of COVID and other things, and I'm curious if it doesn't also apply as we're able to collect more data that might in the past be more personable, not pub, not that data that's publicly observable, but those things that are specifically empirically measured and reporting on something, we're going to, it will be interesting to see for those organizations that have a collective bargaining agreement, as opposed to those that maybe aren't that sophisticated, what do I own? Because I may not want anybody to know that I have a, a medical condition that may be revealed with this trainer, but is pub, but is protected under certain laws. Does that make sense? Do you, we're trying to figure Definitely. that out. A lot of biometric data sits outside of HIPAA because it isn't seen as part of what would be the traditional electronic medical record. Take sleep. <laughs> there is a lot of information one can gain from looking at one's sleep patterns. Really? Oh, very much so. And that then is, how is that used? And it's not unusual for the conversation to be, you know, from an athlete per se, mm -hmm. is this going to be used to hurt my contract renegotiation mm -hmm. or is it going to help me if I if it is known that I've had multiple pre-concussive events you know is that going to be used to help my you know how performance right. or different types of protocols are put in place for training mm -hmm. or is that something that again might be used to hurt a, or a negotiation yeah. or a trade. I, I love the discussion. It is, um, uh, you know, I see, I mean, some of the benefits have to be, well, I'm curious, before we go to the benefits, I do, in another talk, you've mentioned that, um, I believe that you've either worked with in the past, the Olympic Committee, or maybe perhaps still do. It just got me thinking about, do all sporting organizations youth, semi-pro, pro, amateur, these different groups, um, do they, is their approach similar in that, hey, let's, um, let's use uh, wearable or um, electronic monitoring technology, or, or there, do you see a, you know, a, either a different level or just a different approach based upon the type of either sport, athlete, or professional layer, do they treat it differently? And that's a great question. And the answer is very much so. Okay. Um, and one of the areas many Olympic committees are trying to, to figure out are, are there opportunities for us to look at what one sport is doing and port that over to other sports that may also benefit mm -hmm. from a similar type of tracking or technology or mm -hmm. whatever it might be. Um, and the other aspect is also being able to look at athletes who have opportunities for crossover. So, okay, can I figure out who my best sprinters are mm -hmm. that might be good for bobsled? Mm -hmm. um, and then as to the point of, of how these, they're all going about it, every um, organization has different level of resources available and there are different of maturities of technologies that are useful for that particular sport um, that vary greatly as well. So some sports just don't have very many options and others have quite a few. Are there certain sports or certain, gr certain groups that don't embrace putting any, uh, anything on an athlete? You mentioned uh, RFID on, for example, American football, there's cameras in a um, venue at an NBA what about the, in the Olympics or at the collegiate level? Do you know if they wear anything or are they forbidden to wear anything? It depends. <laughs> <laughs> Again. Um, but I think one consistent thing we hear from, whether it's the USOC or, or others, um, figure out a way 
to collect the data and do the analysis without having something to be on the athlete. Hmm. So are there passive collection techniques <clears throat> such that we're not spending an hour calibrating a system, hooking them up right. for a 45 minute training session right. for every single athlete? Right. Um, one of the things that I've heard mention is, you know, what I, when I think of, of a non-camera, I think of a wearable. So they, they're using this in agriculture. They're using these things on um, um, a variety of industry. <clears throat> but I've recently come across this idea of wearable fabric. And I was like, wait, what? How is, what world am I living in? Have you had any experience or have you been exposed to this idea? Very much so. So the future wearable is not what we wear on our wrist. It's going to be our shirt. And um, uh, there is a organization called the FOA, and it's uh, Advanced Functional Fibers and Fabrics of America. And it's an initiative the government's put in place to actually start to facilitate the rapid prototyping and testing of these types of, of fabrics, of smart fabrics. So our shirt, it, you know, in the future, not too far off, it's going to function like our smartphone. I have to do my own laundry. I don't want my laundry judging me by, <laughs> by how I've treated Soon it. Soon you're going to have very judgy laundry. <laughs> <laughs> it just, it, you know, in some ways it blows my mind. I'm a kid of the 60s and 70s and all the sci-fi books that I read and the shows that I watched where you... You could literally, you know, your your outfit could become your armor. Like it was, you know, it seemed science fiction, but it would it monitored everything from your body temp. And um, it, you know, in the beginning of many of these movies and shows, it's it's about analytics. Um, but later it morphs into nanobots and nanomachines and how it actually enhances or supplements or protects uh, the wearer. Do you think do you think smart fabric could be the first gen, it may take a while, but the first gen on that path? Without a doubt. Mm. And um, as you mentioned, being able to use it for performance enhancement and monitoring of, of one's health on a, a consistent basis at a much higher resolution than something on our wrist might. Right. So um, yeah, I, I think it's actually much closer than than you might expect. Well, Tim Cook said, uh, CEO of Apple a couple of years ago said, um, if in 20 years, he said this, I want to say he was on CNBC, but wherever he was, he said, look, if in 20 years, you don't think of us as a healthcare company, we, we have failed, right? We're not a, we don't want to be a technology company. We want to be a healthcare company. We, we really believe in the future of leveraging our technology, the art and science of our technology into helping human beings thrive and flourish through, you know, I'm wearing my smartwatch now, which is keeps uh, reminding me of a couple things. And it's monitoring some of my biometrics. I'm pretty sure it's tied into my wife's um, system. Uh, but that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> but in any event, um, so it's not just sports that are really thinking about, um, you know, without getting cynical about it, really thinking about how do I help human beings flourish? I, I, I put devices on um, that help not only give us a feedback loop, let us know how we're performing, but also can help correct for things that might be going on within our uh, biology at that moment. Exactly. And this is where working and sport is so exciting, kind of back to the, you know, what can we learn from these elite athletes? And I, I liken them similar to as you had mentioned a little earlier, the F1 car. Mm, yeah. Uh, small changes to an F1 car, you're going to see potentially big results. Right. Um, if you're tweaking um, Honda, that ability to see really dynamic changes from a small tweak may, may not be there as quickly. Right. But a lot of innovation has come from F1 into the automotive industry. Think of our athletes as being able to be our test bed for what are these new and interesting 
wellness interventions, nutrition interventions, hydration, nutri- um, sleep. Right. I mean, the athlete, today's athlete has more data being collected about them than ever before. Hmm. And it is now whereby we're able to start to better understand what are the most important components to help with performance and be able to then use those for broader societal health and wellness. Do you you ever think, so if I think of the F1, I love that analogy for a variety of reasons, but it's, the cool thing is the F1 tracks uh, um, where, where it may be more direct than any, any domestic vehicle that we drive, here's the track. We have decades of generation on the track and we can create a digital twin and we can simulate weather. And, and now I've got this very expensive $150, $200 million tool, um, a physical one and an electronic version of it. And I can simulate these things in a simulator and then I can put them on a track and I can, right, they could do all of these micro adjustments and they can control the other environment. Whereas with the Honda, I've driven through the streets of Cambridge. I don't know why they still have roundabouts. It seems like an invention back in the Salem witch trials, but whatever. We love our roundabouts. (laughs) It's um, well, they're starting to populate all over Atlanta. Um, So, which was fine if you've got, you know, centuries of how to negotiate a roundabout. But if you got a bunch, well, I'm just gonna stop there before I get in trouble with my. (laughs) But anyway, So I've got this very controlled environment. Same thing with athletics. I have a field that I'm performing on. I have a a pretty strict training regime, generally that's pretty well documented. It's certainly compared to the civilian world. Military does this usually pretty well as well. Um, And so at least in these controlled environments, you know, you can, under these well-documented, peer-reviewed control conditions, here's what we see when we get 3% better sleep or 10% better stretching or whatever, these these micro changes that give this exponential benefit. Exactly, exactly. And what might that inform for us? Right. Well, I mean, I'm guessing your watch tells you to stand up more often. It does, but it's <laughs> irritating the daylights out of me. I'm in a podcast. What are you doing? Uh, no, it, it does. It says move. It's time to, it, and I can't even tell you, I don't do it every time, but it reminds me all the time, way more than I would have thought before. Even if I'm reading, if I'm sitting and reading and I'm, you know, whatever, hey, get the circulation going and um, take action. I'm wondering what you mentioned this earlier, this idea of a quantified athlete and so many things I really want to dive into, but could you first explain what is it that you mean by what's a quantified athlete? Um, Great question. It is pulling together. First, it is collecting information about them throughout the process of training, sleep, nutrition, hydration, in-game performance, um, and then understanding how best to optimize for that, you know, 0.1% performance enhancement Mm. that really can be gold or no podium. Mm. So it's, it's, it's the data around the athlete that is informing the, the quantified component. Um, it feels like the genies out of the box. Like, and I, you know, I say it that we, I'm sure we've been doing this. Um, I was, when I was thinking, preparing for this podcast, when I was a kid, I worked on an Arabian horse farm and I remember them talking about, they wouldn't have said it in these terms, but they had so much data on the sires and dams going back millennia. In some cases, not in the horses at my farm, they had decades, if not centuries on those horses. Um, but, and they could, they had also the, well, when we bred this, here's the performance of the offspring. When we bred over here, here's the performance, whether it was show, whether it was in competition, uh, like racing and whatever, here's how long they lived. Here are these different circumstances. I'm sure, um, that's not uncommon. And it was, I would say an early sort of form of, a 
for lack of a better word, a quantified athlete. I'm gathering data. I'm introducing micro things. I'm collecting. I'm managing. I'm observing. I'm getting more sophisticated in how I observe this stuff. You, you think there's any correlation there? I mean, I think that um, take basketball. Yeah. I mean, they are fairly tall individuals. <laughs> yeah. They're successful. Unless their name's Allen Iverson, but uh, everybody else pretty tall, yes. Um, well, and, you know, as, as kids come into playing sport, I think it's not unusual for a parent or a coach to tag them as potentially good for a particular position right. or a particular sport. Now, I mean, the, the new conversation is you know, a specialization at a young age, um, actually detrimental to an athlete. Mm. Um, but I don't think it's unusual, especially as we have more information to start to pick out, oh, that individual um, might be really good at sprinting or the long jump mm -hmm. or javelin. Mm -hmm. And then trying to optimize that training pathway mm -hmm or that particular athlete. Do you think that we could end up on a path where it's my tech against your tech, my spreadsheet against your spreadsheet? I mean, is, is there, you know, a, a skeptic of this when I, when I have a conversation like this might say, oh, where is this, where does this all lead us? You know, where, where does technology, where does data, when, you know, are we, are we, um, analyzing the humanness out of out of uh this you know quote unquote a pure sport i think what is exciting about sport is that there are humans involved yeah and i've been asked do we foresee the elimination of the athlete and, and we'll just have robots playing soccer i don't think anybody wants to watch something with a known outcome Right. I think it is you know, watching someone do something great or surprising or be their best self that is compelling. You were mentioning your love of the Olympics. Yeah. I mean, many sports, do you even know that they existed? Do you even have um, the regular viewing of these different disciplines? I think sport is this amazing opportunity to see humans do great things. And it's also a beautiful um, opportunity for a lot of the societal barriers to come down. If we are all fans of a particular team, regardless of where we live or what we do for work or our background. But as we go through this, I do think there, the question bodes how much technology does one implement into game mm -hmm. and what is that balance such that you're still maintaining um, pace of play um, and the excitement of the game with the balance of fairness or rules right i mean none of us would disagree i think it's a, the, a good conversation that we're having about the impact of concussion um i, I never really gave it serious thought until Junior Seau took his own life. And there was so much conversation that came after that. When you look back in professional football, a hundred years before when they were out there playing without helmets and just, you know, uh, just knocking the daylights out of each other and just on and on and on. And so absolutely, I, I love to see that. I just don't want to lose what you're describing the, um, you know, Rudy Tomjanovich saying never discount the heart of a champion or a, the opportunity yes. as unlikely as it is for a Hoosiers moment, or nobody ever saw that. Or when the, when the bulls finally get past Detroit or despite all odds, um, Larry Bird spins a net, like the, you know, these moments of our, of our life that we, um, that we thought we knew what the end was going to be. And then the human being, um, not their algorithm, but the human being remarkably stood up and overcame and just, you know, broke our heart, reimagined 
um, you know, all those things, Kurt Schilling out there on the mound with his ankle and like it's just on and on these iconic moments that we love. And you remember. And I remember, I remember. And, and, and that is where I think the human element being removed from sport, it would no longer be the sport we love. How do you and so, I'm sorry, yeah. go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. I know. Well, I'm curious, how do you see this changing in all industry? For sure, we're talking about the user experience. Call it fan engagement. I don't care if you're using Salesforce or you know Google or Netflix or whatever. It's the user experience. So how do you imagine this impacting the people that are observing the sport getting them involved and just really enhancing, whether it's the venue itself or some other technology that we're able to le uh, leverage to change the user experience. Yeah, I think we're gonna continue to see um, more AR, um, augmented reality, mm -hmm. um, engagement, uh, I call it a tool, it's not actually a tool, but um, experience. Right. Um, for example, say I, go to um, a hockey game mm -hmm. and my favorite player is on the ice and I'm able to just point my phone at them and I get new insights or data around speed or fun snippets about that particular athlete. Um, new ways of getting to uh, customize my viewing experience. So do I want to watch a basketball game with X's and O's? Or do I want to have something that is a little bit more kind of fanciful? Cool in racing is they have you, you know, they've been doing this for decades. We don't think about it like this, but I think it's the same idea. I'm riding along with the driver. They'll put the camera on their feet. If you're watching esports, online gaming, they'll have the health of the character. And so you see these combatants kind of going at it and you're watching both of their health and you're like, which one's gonna, you know, who's gonna survive? Right, right. You know, and I think we're gonna continue to see uh, teams look for ways to one um, term that is, is becoming more common is the experience in the experience. So I am going to the game, but there's also kind of experiences within the stadium mm. or the arena. Um, and then what does that look like at home? Mm -hmm. And so being able to customize my, my viewing in ways that whether I'm on my phone or a laptop or a TV, that is aligned with the way I like to consume sports. And yeah. I think this other component is as soon as you start to do that, you also give rise to more interesting opportunities around sponsorship. That's a great idea. I, you know, one of the things that we've done, we are cable cutters. We're very much over the top kind of people in our house. I've got yep. people that love their anime. I've got people that love their whatever. I'm not going to list all our things out there and be called a super nerd, but we love. Um, and so we customize sort of our, um, experience. Is that what you're talking about here? Exactly. Exactly. That customization then also gives more information about who you are versus others um, in your family. Right. Whereby before it might have just been one TV or maybe two couple of TVs wasn't clear who was sitting in front of them and how was this being consumed. Now, if I'm able to customize my experience, I also, you know, from a sponsor, side or even the team side to start to better understand how do they want to engage with it and how might we put forth information or opportunities for more knowledge <coughs> and better targeted experiences whether it be sponsorship or the team itself or the league how do you think this is going to impact I, I guess I'm thinking of the future now and I know we just have a few more minutes but all of these things we're talking about, it, I remember in the 70s, one of the most feared players was a guy named Dick Buckus in the NFL. If you came across when he was a linebacker, God help you, they may lose the game, but his helmet imprint is going to be here. No disrespect to Mr. Buckus, but if he were to play today, 
probably Alabama would be able to hit as hard or harder just at the collegiate level. So the athletes through training and nutrition and just so many things we've learned in the last 40 years of playing American football really have perfected this. How do you think the role, are, are any records going to stand? Are any, you know, what's the impact towards, and how do we relate them? Um, the the, uh, the records that we have, the um, the experiences that rem we remember with fondness looking forward. So my hot take, we're going to continue to break records. Um, but the game is not played as it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. Hmm. And so I think you can constantly have a good argument about you know, how do you compare one athlete to another athlete or one team's record to another team's record? But the sure. fact of the matter is, it's not the same game. And likely the rules have changed in some variants, yeah. whether it's tackling or a shot clock or any number of, of other aspects. Yeah. So I think it is a fun conversation and nearly impossible to, to really compare because it's not an, an equal comparison. Well, I don't know if there's a rule change, but certainly the single greatest almost rule change that they ever instituted in the NBA was they got away from those 80s gym shorts and got into <laughs> long shorts because I felt a little uncomfortable while uh, those uh, those grown men were running around in those. I, I think you're right. I mean, it's curious to see in some things they don't innovate. The, the bag is the same size on a baseball diamond. The bat is still uh, a bat, and yet they've innovated in so many ways. We're watching the time of this recording. The, um, the World Series will be over by the time this is published, but we've enjoyed so many great games, and we've had that kind of over the top fan experience on our devices while we're watching it on TV, keeping up and so many stats and the, the pitcher zone. And was that really a strike? And it's uh, it's phenomenal. And yet we don't know what's going to happen when we turn on to watch. Um, well, I'm not going to say any spoilers about the Sox, but to watch the Sox or the Braves or whoever as they march towards uh, a World Series in 2021. It's really cool to see. It really is. And there's a lot of technology that has gone into helping prepare the team and the athletes to get them there. Well, Christina, thank you for coming on the show today. I, um, first of all, for taking time out, I know you're teaching right now. You guys are full, uh, full on in your semester there at MIT. I really hope you'll consider coming back on our show next year. we got a little bit more time and things aren't quite as hectic. I appreciate it. It's been a great conversation. It's been fantastic. Thank you so much for the, the fun conversation. Our pleasure. And if you've enjoyed the show, please like, share, subscribe, and comment. And we'll see you next time on the QTS Experience. Thank you, everybody.